Disc Teen, Mask Raid By Terry Pratchett Audiobook 14x16 No harm in letting me see it, is there? Not old na- old nanny. Can't see it till it's finished. Well, now, said nanny, hating herself for dropping the atom bomb, I'm sure your ma'am wouldn't want to hear that you've been a bad boy, would she? Expressions floated over Walter's waxen features as he struggled with several ideas at once. Finally, without a word, he thrust the bundle at her, his arms trembling with tension. 296 Terry Pratchett There's a good boy, said Nanny. She glanced at the first few pages, and then moved them nearer to the light. Hum she treadled the harmonium for a while and played a few notes with her left hand. They represented most of the musical notes she knew how to read. It was a very simple little theme, such as might be picked out on the keyboard with one finger. Hey! Her lips moved as she read the narrative. Well now, Walter, she said, isn't this a sort of opera about a ghost who lives in an opera house? She turned a page. Very smart and debonair, he is. He's got a secret cave, I see, she played another short riff. Catchy music, too. She read on, occasionally saying things like well, well, and locks. Every now and again she'd give Walter an appraising look. I wonder why the ghost wrote this, Walter, she said, after a while. Quiet sort of chap, ain't he? Put it all into his music. Walter stared at his feet. There's going to be a lot of trouble MRS. Og. Oh, me and Granny will sort it all out, said Nanny. It's wrong to tell lies said Walter. Probably, said Nanny, who'd never let it worry her up to now. It wouldn't be right for our mum to lose her job MRS. Og. It wouldn't be right, no. The feeling drifted over Nanny that Walter was trying to put across some sort of message. ER. 297 Masquerade What sort of lies would it be wrong to tell, Walter? Walter's eyes bulged. Lies, about things you see MRS. Og. Even if you did see them. Nanny thought it was probably time to present the Ogish point of view. It's all right to tell lies if you don't think lies, she said. He said our mum would lose her job and I'd be locked up if I said MRS. Og. Did he? Which he was he? The ghost MRS. Og. I reckon Granny ought to have a good look at you, Walter, said Nanny. I reckon your mind's all tangled up like a ball of string what's been dropped. She peddled the harmonium thoughtfully. Was it the ghost that wrote all this music, Walter? It's wrong to tell lies about the room with the sax in it MRS. Og. Ah, thought Nanny. That'd be down here, would it? He said I wasn't to tell anyone. Who did? The ghost MRS. Og. But your nanny began, and then tried another way. Ah, but I ain't anyone, she said. Anyway, if you was to go to this room with the sacks and I was to follow you, that wouldn't be telling anyone, would it? It wouldn't be your fault if some OLE woman followed you, would it? Walter's face was an agony of indecision but, erratic though his thinking might have been, it was no match for Nanny Og's meretricious duplicity. He was up against a mind that regarded truth as a 298 Terry Pratchett reference point but certainly not American Samoa a shackle. Nanny Og could think her way through a corkscrew in a tornado without touching the sides. Anyway, it's all right if it's me, she added for good measure. In fact, he probably meant to say except for MRS. Og, only he forgot. Slowly, Walter reached out and picked up a candle. Without saying a word he walked out of the door and into the damp darkness of the cellars. Nanny Og followed him, 
her boots making squelching noises in the mud. It didn't seem like much of a distance. As far as Nanny could work out they were no longer under the opera house, but it was hard to be sure. Their shadows danced around them and they walked through other rooms, even more dark and dripping than the ones they'd been in. Walter stopped in front of a pile of timber that glistened with rot, and pulled a few of the spongy planks aside. There were some sacks neatly piled. Nanny kicked one, and it broke. In the flickering candlelight all that she could really see were sparkles of light as the cascade poured out, but there was no mistaking the gentle metallic scraping of lots of money. Lots and lots of money. Enough money to suggest very clearly that it belonged to either a thief or a publisher, and there didn't seem to be any books around. What's this, Walter? It's the ghost's money MRS. Og. There was a square hole in the opposite corner of the room. Water glinted a few inches below. Beside the hole were half a dozen containers of VAR 299 masquerade ES sorts old biscuit tins, broken bowls and the like. There was a stick, or possibly a dead shrub, in each one. And those, Walter? What are those? Rose bushes MRS. Og. Down here? But nothing could gr nanny stopped. She squelched over to the pots. They'd been filled with muck scraped from the floor. The dead stems glistened with slime. Nothing could grow down here, of course. There was no light. Everything that grew needed something else to feed on. And, she moved the candle closer and sniffed the fragrance. Yes. It was subtle, but it was there. Roses in darkness. Well, my word, Walter Plinge, she said. Always one for the surprises, you are. Books were piled on MR. Bucket's desk. What you're doing is wrong, Granny Weatherwax, said Agnes from the doorway. Granny glanced up. Wrong as living other people's lives for them, she said. As matter of fact, there's something even worse than that, which is living other people's lives for yourself. That kind of wrong. Agnes said nothing. Granny Weatherwax couldn't know. Granny turned back to the books. Anyway, this only looks wrong. Appearances is deceiving. You just pay attention to watching the corridor. Madam. She riffled through the bits of torn envelope and scribbled notes that seemed to be the Opera 300 Terry Pratchett House's equivalent of proper accounts. It was a mess. In fact, it was more than a mess. It was far too much of a mess to be a real mess, because a real mess has occasional bits of coherence, bits of what might be called random order. Rather, it was the kind of erratic mess that suggested that someone had set out to be messy. Take the account books. They were full of tiny rows and columns, but someone hadn't thought it worthwhile to invest in lined paper and had handwriting that wandered a bit. There were 40 rows on the left-hand side but only 36 by the time they reached the other side of the page. It was hard to spot because of the way your eyes watered. What are you doing? said Agnes, tearing her gaze away from the corridor. Amazin', said Granny. Some things is entered twice. And I reckon there's a page here where someone's added the month and taken away the time of day. I thought you didn't like books, said Agnes. I don't, said Granny, turning a page. They can look you right in the face and still lie. How many fiddle players are there in the band? I think there are nine violinists in the orchestra. The correction appeared to pass unnoticed. Well, there's a thing, said Granny, without moving her head. Seems that twelve of em are drawing wages, but three of em is over the page, so you mightn't notice. She looked up and rubbed her hands happily. Unless you've got a good memory, that is. She ran a skinny finger down another erratic column. What's a flying ratchet? 
301 mass grade I don't know. Says here repairs to flying ratchet, new springs for rotation cog assembly, and making good. $160.63. Ha! She licked her finger and tried another page. Even Nanny ain't this bad at numbers, she said. To be this bad at numbers you've got to be good. Ha! No wonder this place never makes any money. You might as well try to fill a sieve. Agnes darted into the room. There's someone coming. Granny got up and blew out the lamp. You get behind the curtains, she commanded. What are you going to do? Oh, I'll just have to make myself inconspicuous. Agnes hurried across to the big window and turned to look at Granny, who was standing by the fireplace. The old witch faded. She didn't disappear. She merely slid into the background. An arm gradually became part of the mantelpiece. A fold of her dress was a piece of shadow. An elbow became the top of the chair behind her. Her face became one with a vase of faded flowers. She was still there, like the old woman in the puzzle picture they sometimes printed in the almanac, where you could see the old woman or the young girl but not both at once, because one was made of the shadows of the other. Granny Weatherwax was standing by the fireplace, but you could see her only if you knew she was there. Agnes blinked. And there were just the shadows, the chair, and the fire. 302 Terry Pratchett the door opened. She ducked behind the curtains, feeling as conspicuous as a strawberry in a stew, certain that the sound of her heart would give her away. The door shut, carefully, with barely a click. Footsteps crossed the floor. A wooden scraping noise might have been a chair being moved slightly. A scratch and a hiss were the sound of a match, striking. A clink was the glass of the lamp, being lifted. All noise ceased. Agnes crouched, every muscle suddenly screaming with the strain. The lamp hadn't been lit she'd have seen the light around the curtain. Someone out there was making no noise. Someone out there was suddenly suspicious. A floorboard squeaked very slowly, as someone shifted their weight. She felt as if she was going to scream, or burst with the effort of silence. The handle of the window behind her, a mere point of pressure a moment ago, was trying seriously to become part of her life. Her mouth was so dry that she knew it'd creak like a hinge if she dared to swallow. It couldn't be anyone who had a right to be here. People who had a right to be in places walked around noisily. The handle was getting really personal. Try to think of something else. The curtain moved. Someone was standing on the other side of it. If her throat weren't so arid she might be able to scream. She could feel the presence through the cloth. 303 mass grade any moment now, someone was going to twitch the curtain aside. She leapt, or as close to a leap as was feasible it was a kind of vertical lumber, billowing the curtain aside, colliding with a slim body behind it and ending on the floor in a tangle of limbs and ripping velvet. She gulped air, and pressed down on the squirming bundle below her. I'll scream, she said. And if I do your eardrums will come down your nose. The writhing stopped. Perdifa, said a muffled voice. Above her, the curtain rail sagged at one end and the brass rings, one at a time, spun toward the floor. Nanny went back to the sacks. Each one bulged with round hard shapes that clinked gently under her questing finger. This is a lot of money, Walter, she said carefully. Yes MRS. Og. Nanny lost track of money fairly easily, although this didn't mean the subject didn't interest her. It was just that, beyond a certain point, it became dreamlike. All she could be sure of was that the amount in front of her would make anyone's drawers drop. I suppose, she said, that if I was to ask you how it got here, you'd say it was the ghost, yes? Like the roses. 
Yes, MRS. Og. 304 Terry Pratchett she gave him a worried look. You'll be all right down here, will you, she said. You'll sit quiet. I reckon I need to talk to some people. Where's my mum MRS? Og. She's having a nice sleep, Walter. Walter seemed satisfied with this. You'll sit quiet in your, in that room, will you? Yes MRS. Og. There's a good boy. She glanced at the money bags again. Money was trouble. Agnes sat back. Andre raised himself on his elbows and pulled the curtain off his face. What the hell were you doing there, he said. I was what do you mean, what was I doing there? You were creeping around. You were hiding behind the curtain, said Andre, getting to his feet and fumbling for the matches again. Next time you blow out a lamp, remember it'll still be warm. We were, on important business, the lamp glowed. Andre turned. We, he said. Agnes nodded, and looked across at Granny. The witch hadn't moved, although it took a deliberate effort of will to focus on her among the shapes and shadows. Andre picked up the lamp and stepped forward. The shadows shifted. Well, he said. Agnes strode across the room and waved a hand 305 masquerade in the air. There was the chair back, there was the vase, there was, nothing else. But she was there. A ghost, eh, said Andre sarcastically. Agnes backed away. There is something about the light of a lamp held lower than someone's face. The shadows are wrong. They fall in unfortunate places. Teeth seem more prominent. Agnes came to realize that she was alone in a room in suspicious circumstances with a man whose face suddenly looked a lot more unpleasant than it had before. I suggest, he said, that you get back to the stage right now, yes? That would be the very best thing you could do. And don't meddle in things that don't concern you. You've done too much as it is. The fear hadn't drained out of Agnes, but it had found a space in which to metamorphose into anger. I don't have to put up with that. For all I know, you might be the ghost. Really? I was told that Walter Plinge was the ghost, said Andre. How many people did you tell? And now it turns out that he's dead, no, he's not. It was out before she could stop it. She'd said it merely to wipe the sneer off his face. This happened. But the expression that replaced it was no improvement. A floorboard creaked. They both turned. There was a hat stand in the corner, next to a bookcase. There were a few coats and scarves hanging from it. It was surely only the way that the 306 Terry Pratchett shadows fell that made it look, from this angle, like an old woman. Or. Damn floors, said Granny, fading into the foreground. She stepped away from the coats. As Agnes said, later. It wasn't as though she'd been invisible. She'd simply become part of the scenery until she put herself forward again. She was there, but not there. She didn't stand out at all. She was as unnoticeable as the very best of butlers. How did you get in, said Andre. I looked all round the room. Sian is believin', said Granny, calmly. Of course, the trouble is that believin' is also Sian, and there's been too much of that round here lately. Now, I know you ain't the ghost. So what are you, to be sneaking around in places where you shouldn't be? I could ask you the same quest me. I'm a witch, and I'm pretty good at it. She's, er, from Lancray. Where I come from, Agnes mumbled, trying to look at her feet. Oh? Not the one who wrote the book, said Andre. I've heard people talking about no. I'm much worse than her, understand. She is, 
mumbled Agnes. Andre gave Granny a long look, like a man weighing up his chances. He must have decided that they were bobbing along the ceiling. I, hang around in dark places looking for trouble, he said. Really? There's a nasty name for people like that, snapped Granny. Yes, said Andre. It's policemen. 307 Masquerade Nanny Og climbed out of the cellars, rubbing her chin thoughtfully. Musicians and singers were still milling around, uncertain about what was going to happen next. The ghost had had the decency to be chased and killed during the interval. In theory that meant there was no reason why there shouldn't be a third act, as soon as Herr Trubelmacher had scoured the nearby pubs and dragged the orchestra back. The show must go on. Yes, she thought, it has to go on. It's like the build-up to a thunderstorm, no, it's more like making love. Yes. That was a far more oggish metaphor. You put everything you've got into it, so sooner or later there's a point where it's got to go on, because you can't imagine stopping. The stage manager could dock a couple of dollars from their wages and they'd still go on, and everyone knew it and they would still go on. She reached a ladder and climbed slowly into the flies. She hadn't been certain. She needed to be certain now. The fly loft was empty. She walked carefully along the catwalk until she was over the auditorium. The buzz of the audience came through the ceiling beneath her, slightly muffled. Light shone up at the point where the thick cable for the chandelier disappeared into the hole. She stepped out over the creaking trap door and peered down. Terrific heat almost frizzled her hair. A few yards below her hundreds of candles were burning. 308 Terry Pratchett dreadful if that lot fell down, she said quietly. I spect this place d go up like a haystack, she let her gaze travel up and up the cable to the point, at just about waist height, where it was half cut through. You'd never see it if you weren't expecting to find it. Then her gaze dropped again, and moved across the gloomy, dusty floor until it found something half-hidden in the dust. Behind her, a shadow among the shadows rose to its feet, balanced itself carefully, and started to run. I knows about policemen, said Granny. They've got big helmets and big feet and you can see them a mile off. There's a couple lurching around backstage. Anyone can see their policeman. You don't look like one. She turned the badge over and over in her hands. I ain't happy with the idea of secret policemen, she said. Why do you need secret policemen? Because, said Andre, sometimes you have secret criminals. Granny almost smiled. That's a fact, she said. She peered at the small engraving on the back of the batch. Says here Cable Street Particulars, there aren't many of us, said Andre. We've only just started. Commander Vim said that, since we can't do anything about the Thieves' Guild and the Assassins' Guild, we'd better look for other crimes. Hidden crimes. That need watchmen with, different skills. And I can play the piano quite well. 309 Masquerade What kind of skills have that troll and that dwarf got, said Granny. Seems to me the only thing they're really good at is standing around looking obvious and stupid, ha. Huh? Yes, right. And they didn't even need much training, said Andre. Commander Vim says they're the most obvious policemen anyone could think of. Incidentally, Corporal Nobbs has got some papers to prove he's a human being forged. I don't think so. Granny Weatherwax put her head on one side. If your house was on fire, what's the first thing you'd take out of it? Oh, Granny Agnes began. Hmm. Who set fire to it, said Andre. You're a policeman, right enough. Granny handed him his badge. You come to arrest poor Walter, she said. I know he didn't murder drive. Undershaft. 
I was watching him. He was trying to unblock the privies all afternoon I've had proof that Walter isn't the ghost, said Agnes. I was almost sure it was Saul's Ella, said Andre. I know he creeps off to the cellars sometimes and I'm sure he's stealing money. But the ghost has been seen when Saul's Ella is perfectly visible. So now I think think. Think, said Granny. Someone thinking around here at last? How do you recognize the ghost, Mr. Policeman? Well, he's got a mask on, really? Now say it again, and listen to what 310 Terry Pratchett you say. Good grief. You can recognize him because he's got a mask on? You recognize him because you don't know who he is? Life isn't neat. Whoever said there's only one ghost? The figure ran through the shadows of the fly loft, cloak billowing around it. Nanny Og was outlined against the light, peering down. She said, without turning her head. Hello, Mr. Ghost. Come back for your saw, have you? Then she darted around behind the cable until she faced the shadow. Millions of people knows I'm up here. You wouldn't hurt a little old lady, would you? Oh, dear, me poor old heart. She keeled over backward, hitting the floor hard enough to make the cable swing. The figure hesitated. Then it took a length of thin rope from a pocket and advanced cautiously toward the fallen witch. It knelt down, wound an end of the rope around each hand, and leaned forward. Nanny's knee came up sharply. Feels a lot better now, mister, she said, as he reared backward. She scrambled up again and grabbed the saw. Come back to finish it, eh, she said, waving the implement in the air. Wonder how you'd blame that on Walter. Make you happy, would it, the whole place burning down? The figure, moving awkwardly, backed away as she advanced. Then it turned, lurched along the wobbling catwalk and disappeared into the gloom. Nanny pounded after him and saw the figure 311 masquerade climbing down a ladder. She looked around quickly, grabbed a rope to slide after him and heard a pulley somewhere above start to clatter. She descended, skirts billowing around her. When she was about halfway down, a bunch of sandbags went upward past her in a hurry. As she rattled onward she saw, between her boots, someone struggling with the trap door to the cellars. She landed a few feet away, still holding the rope. Mr. Saul's Ella Nanny stuck two fingers in her mouth and let out a whistle that could have melted earwax. She let go of the rope. Saul's Ella glanced up at her as he raised the trap door, and then saw the shape dropping out of the roof. 180 pounds of sandbag hit the door, slamming it shut. Watch out, said Nanny, cheerfully. Bucket waited nervously in the wings. Unnecessarily nervously, of course. The ghost was dead. There couldn't be anything to worry about. People said they'd seen him killed, although they were, Bucket had to admit, a bit hazy on the actual details. Nothing to worry about. Not a thing. Nothing whatsoever in any way. Everything was absolutely nothing to worry about in any way. He ran a finger around the inside of his collar. It hadn't been such a bad life in wholesale cheese. 312 Terry Pratchett The most you had to worry about was one of poor old Reg Plenty's trouser buttons in the farmhouse nutty and the time young Weevens minced his thumb in the stirring machine and it was only by luck they happened to be doing strawberry yogurt at the time a figure loomed up beside him. He clutched at a curtain for support and then turned to see, with relief, the majestic and reassuring stomach of Enrico Basilica. The tenor looked magnificent in a huge cockerel costume, complete with giant beak, wattles, and comb. Ah, senor, Bucket burbled. Very impressive, may I say. S.I., said a muffled voice from somewhere behind the beak, 
as other members of the company hurried past onto the stage. May I say how sorry I am about all that business earlier. I can assure you that it doesn't happen every night, ahaha, si. Probably just high spirits, ahaha, the beak turned toward him. Bucket backed away. Si. Yes, well, I'm glad you're so understanding, temperamental, he thought, as the tenor strode onto the stage and the overture to Act Three drifted to its close. They're like that, the real artists. Nerves stretched like rubber bands, I expect. It's just like waiting for the cheese, really. You can get really edgy waiting to see whether you've got half a ton of best blue vein or just a vat 313 mask grade full of pig food. It's probably like that when you've got an aria working its way up where'd he go? Where'd he go? What? Oh, MRS. Og. The old woman waved a saw in front of his face. It was not, in MR. Bucket's current state of mental tension, a helpful gesture. He was suddenly surrounded by other figures, equally conducive to multiple exclamation marks. Perdita? Why aren't you on stage, oh, Lady Esmeralda, I didn't see you there, of course if you want to come backstage you only have to wear Saul's Ella said Andre. Bucket looked around vaguely. He was here a few minutes ago, that is, he said, pulling himself together, Mr. Saul's Ella is probably attending to his duties somewhere which, young man, is more than I can say for I demand you stop the show now, said Andre. Oh, you do, do you? And by what authority, may I ask? He's been sawing through the rope, said Nanny. Andre pulled out a batch. This. Bucket looked closely. Ankh Morpork Guild of Musicians Member 1244. Andre glared at him, then at the batch, and started to pat his pockets urgently. No. Blast, I know I had the other one a moment ago, look, you've got to clear the theater, we've got to search it and that means don't stop the show, said Granny. I won't stop the show, said Bucket. Cause I reckon he'd like to see the show stopped. 314 Terry Pratchett the show must go on, eh? Isn't that what you believe? Could he have got out of the building? I sent Corporal Nobbs to the stage door and Sergeant Detritus is in the foyer, said Andre. When it comes to standing in doorways, they're among the best. Excuse me, what's happening, said Bucket. He could be anywhere, said Agnes. There are hundreds of hiding places. Who, said Bucket. How about these cellars everyone talks about, said Granny. Where? There's only one entrance, said Andre. He's not stupid. He can't get into the cellars, said Nanny. He ran off. Probably in a cupboard somewhere by now. No, he'll stay where there's crowds, said Granny. That's what I'd do. What, said Bucket. Could he have got into the audience from here, said Nanny. Who, said Bucket. Granny jerked a thumb toward the stage. He's somewhere on there. I can feel him. Then we'll wait until he comes off. Eighty people coming off stage all at once, said Agnes. Don't you know what it's like when the curtain goes down? And we don't want to stop the show, Granny mused. No, we don't want to stop the show, said Bucket, grasping at a familiar idea as it swept by on 315 masquerade a tide of incomprehensibility or give people their money back in any fashion whatsoever. What are we talking about, does anyone know? The show must go on, murmured Granny Weatherwax, still staring out of the wings. Things have to end right. This is an opera house. They should end, operatically, Nanny Og hopped up and down excitedly. Oh oh, I know what you're thinking, 
Esm, she squeaked. Oh, oh, yes. Can we? Just so's I can say I done it. Eh? Can we? Go on. Let's. Henry Lawsey peered closely at his opera notes. He had not, of course, fully understood the events of the first two acts, but knew that this was perfectly okay because one would have to be quite naive to expect good sense as well as good songs. Anyway, it would all be explained in the last act, which was the masked ball in the Duke's palace. It would almost certainly turn out that the woman one of the men had been rather daringly courting would be his own wife, but so cunningly disguised by a very small mask that her husband wouldn't have spotted that she wore the same clothes and had the same hairstyle. Someone's serving man would turn out to be someone else's daughter in disguise, someone would die of something that didn't prevent them from singing about it for several minutes, and the plot would be resolved by some coincidences which, in real life, would be as likely as a cardboard hammer. He didn't know any of this for a fact. He was making a calculated guess. 316 Terry Pratchett in the meantime Act 3 opened with the traditional ballet, this time apparently a country dance by the maidens of the court. Henry was aware of muffled laughter around him. This was because, if you ran an eye at head height along the row of ballerinas as they tripped, arm in arm, onto the stage, there was an apparent gap. This was only filled if the gaze went downward a foot or two, to a small fat ballerina in a huge grin, an overstretched tutu, long white drawers and, boots. Henry stared. They were big boots. They moved back and forth at an astonishing speed. The satin slippers of the other dancers twinkled as they drifted across the floor, but the boots flashed and clattered like a tap dancer afraid of falling into the sink. The pirouettes were novel, too. While the other dancers whirled like snowflakes, the little fat one spun like a top and moved across the floor like one, two, bits of her anatomy trying to achieve local orbit. Around Henry members of the audience were whispering to one another. Oh yes, he heard someone declare, they tried this in Pseudopolis, his mother nudged him. This supposed to happen. E.R., I don't think so, s bloody good, though. A good laugh. As the fat ballerina collided with a donkey in evening dress she staggered and grabbed at his mask, which came off. 317 mask great hair troublemaker, the conductor, froze in horror and astonishment. Around him the orchestra rattled to a standstill except for the tuba player Umba 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 who had memorized his score years ago and never took much interest in current affairs. Two figures rose upright in front of Trubal Macker. A hand grabbed his baton. Sorry, sir, said Andre, but the show must go on, yes. He handed the stick to the other figure. There you are, he said. And don't let them stop. Okay. The librarian carefully lifted Herr Trubelmacher aside with one hand, licked the baton thoughtfully, and then focused his gaze on the tuba player. Um ba um ba hi, um, oh um. The tuba player tapped a trombonist on the shoulder. Hey, Frank, there's a monkey where old troublemaker should be shut up shut up shut up. Satisfied, the orangutan raised his arms. The orchestra looked up and then looked up a bit more. No conductor in musical history, not even the one who once fried and ate the piccolo player's liver on a cymbal for one wrong note too many, not even the one who skewered three troublesome violinists on his baton, not even the one who made really hurtful sarcastic remarks in a loud voice, was ever the focus of such reverential attention. On stage, Nanny Og took advantage of the hush to pull the head off a frog. Madam. 318 Terry Pratchett sorry, thought you might be someone else, the long arms dropped. The orchestra, in one huge muddled chord, slammed back into life. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.